changes in the makeup of the city that we've seen in a generation. And some of that is because of the tech boom, which we've seen before, but I don't think anyone's ever seen anything quite like this, and the gentrification that comes with that. But some of it is also because of very specific plans that are being made, that are looking at how land ought to be used in San Francisco and the Bay Area now and over the next 25 years. And we've spent a lot of time looking at what those plans are and what they mean. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. The background on this is that a few years ago, the California State Legislature decided that they wanted to fight greenhouse gases and global climate change. But 
They didn't want to, for example, tax gasoline or put a lot of money into public transit or anything like that. Instead, they came up with this idea of SB 375 and the Sustainable Community Strategy. The idea of this is something that's derived from what's called smart growth, which some environmentalists have been into for a while. The idea being, we're going to concentrate growth in already developed urban areas through infill development. And by doing that, we'll get people to stop driving from the suburbs to jobs in San Francisco. They'll be living near their jobs in San Francisco because that's where we're going to build the new housing. And then they'll take buses or they'll take transit. And by doing this, we will reduce greenhouse gases, which sounds just brilliant in theory. And you can see how somebody came up with this idea and said this is going to work. But there's a lot of problems with it. Um, the, just so you know, there's going to be some acronyms thrown around tonight. Um, I'm going to give you a primer. ABAG is the Association of Bay Area Governments. MTC is the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. They are the two agencies that were tasked by the state legislature with figuring out how to draft a sustainable communities strategy plan for the Bay Area. All right? They are a regional government agency. They do not have direct control over land use in San Francisco, but they do have a lot of influence because they control a fair amount of money. Um, SCS is the Sustainable Community Strategy that I just talked about. PDA is what's known as Priority Development Areas. These are on some of the maps that you see around here. Priority Development Areas are the orange on this map. Those are the areas that ABAG and MTC think development should go into. This is where we should increase urban density. Um, there's also a term, COC, Community of Concern. We're going to talk about that tonight too. Communities of Concern are primarily low-income communities of color that are a threat for displacement. And one of the fun things we'll see tonight if you look at the map over there is if you look at the priority development areas and you look at the communities of concern and you put them on top of each other, guess what? It's the same essential map. All right. um, what this means for San Francisco in quick terms is 280,000 more people, 92,000 more housing units, and 73,000 more cars. And that's my estimate because one of the things that ABAG and MTC have done after they've done all of this work to make sure that we're going to get people out of our cars is assume that we're not going to get people out of their cars and they're going to keep on driving. What's missing in this whole plan is several things. One is a way to stop displacement because there are people already living where they want to put in new high density market rate housing and we've seen how that's worked in San Francisco. Um, there's really not a lot in this plan that looks seriously at how to decrease, decrease driving and improve transit. There's really not a huge recognition, and some of you got this map when you walked in, of the fact that a lot of these priority development areas are going to be underwater in 50 years. Nor is there money for any of it. What it would take to improve Muni and improve BART to the point where we could actually handle all of these people is a very big number that is not in this plan, nor is there any way that we can actually get that money. So what we're going to talk about tonight is all of that and also what do we do now. Obviously, there's a need for regional planning. We're not, people are going to say, oh, no, 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 every little community should be an island. This needs to be done, it needs to be done in a different way that takes into account justice and equity issues. Um, we need to look at what the ABAC plan is and how we can influence and try to change that. Um, we also need to recognize that a lot of these battles are going to play out right here in San Francisco because we still control land use in San Francisco. And essentially, ABAC can say, I want 280,000 more people in this town, and you're going to build 92,000 more housing units. But San Francisco still has the right to say, wait, we want them here, we want them here. We don't want them, and this is the fact that we want. No. And in the end, all, the other thing we have to think about is what the state is doing to us. Because the state is essentially saying, through SB 375, we want you to do this. What they're not saying is, we're going to give you the tools to fight displacement. Because what they've done is taken those away through the Ellis Act and through Costa Hawkins and a lot of other things that we'll be talking about tonight. At that point, I'm going to stop talking. And I'm going to introduce our panel. We have a great panel tonight, people who have looked at this issue, who have thought about this a lot, and who are going to have a lot of things to say. As I say, at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions. We have Mike Casey, who's the head of Unite Here Local 2. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> We have Maria Zabudo, who is with Casa Husta Sasparas. We have Cindy Wu, who is a member of the San Francisco Planning Commission. We have Bob Allen, who is with Urban Habitat. And again, Fujioka, who is with the Chinatown Community Development Corporation. And 
point, I'm going to turn it over to Yen, who's going to go through and amplify some of the things I've talked about and kind of give you a much longer background on what we're talking about here tonight. Yen. Yeah.
I'll see you um, on yesterday. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think Mayor Lee's statement, which was quoted as well in the paper, and this was part of a very interesting Q&A uh, yesterday, uh, uh, both around the SES and also around displacement, uh, questions posed by uh, uh, Super, Supervisor Mar and Supervisor Avalos. Um, and you know, I, I, I we laugh, but actually, this is I think this is a true statement. Uh, maybe there are cities that have better anti-displacement policies, but uh, uh, we need to learn about them. But I, I think San Francisco, certainly within the region, is is viewed as a model. Uh, and, and indeed, my, many of the recommendations for preventing displacement in other cities are uh, is basically to adopt the San Francisco model. Um, if, if we have the best, the toughest anti-displacement um, policies uh, in the nation, uh, this, this, I, I thought this data was, was, was striking. It was provided by a graduate student, Doug Lucy Berkeley, uh, uh, his name, uh, uh, Clayton. Uh, anyway, that was, yeah, I think he's out of touch now. But, uh, but in any case, what this data shows is the decline of the African American population of the city. I kind of uh, see it in the back. And, and what you see is a, the decline, on one hand, the declining numbers from the San Francisco population, the rising numbers of the population in San Joaquin County, out of the region. Uh, and indeed, as we trace displacement of, of, of African Americans and other communities of color, we've seen them scattered across the region. So if we have the best, the toughest anti-displacement policy in the country, then we are in some trouble. Um, uh, so as, as Tim mentioned, I'll, I'll go this very briefly, there are two mandates for, for Plan Bay Area, uh, or the SDS, which Plan Bay Area is, is, is uh, a response to. One is to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, and the other is to plan for sufficient housing um, for growth, uh, to address 100% of the region's projected growth. Um, now, it doesn't say, it, it, the plan doesn't have to guarantee that they actually are produced, but you have to plan and, so, and, and zone sufficient land in the area for production. So, the, the plan that was produced, plan the area, um, uh, looked at six different alternatives, and I, I'm not going to go through them, um, uh, but basically the ones that we're going to talk about today are the preferred plan, uh, the, the, stra uh, the PDA strategy, the strategy that relies upon the priority of, uh, of, of pushing development into planned development areas, or priority <coughs> development areas, as Tim referred to earlier. And then there is, um, really through advocacy on the community side throughout the region, the region was, was compelled to um, come up with a, I think if you're familiar with the secret process, you're supposed to look at different alternatives. They actually had some very you know, divergent uh, uh, models, but one that didn't really prioritize equity. And so one alternative strategy was uh, proposed. Uh, and we'll talk more about it. I'm sure some of the other panelists will speak to about it later. But there were two that were proposed. Uh, there were six. But this one, uh, the, the equity environmental jobs um, alternative um, was also analyzed. This is the um, map um, of, of the priority development areas um, that are designated by uh, basically cities nominate areas where they uh, propose to um, grow jobs and build housing. Uh, and uh, there's some other criteria, but basically uh, this is not something that's imposed on us by the region. This is something that each municipality, cities, uh, counties uh, propose to do. And as you can see, um, almost all, if not all, uh, of the eastern side of the city uh, is proposed for that growth. Um, and let me say, I think we should, uh, some of the conversations we had before, you know, I, I, I think as we talk about growth and increasing density, I, I don't think those of us on the panel are opposed to growth or density um, uh, per se, but we're, we're, we're interested in, in equitable growth and development, and it's certainly interesting that 
there is none of it on the west side. So here are some of the, the, the numbers. Um, uh, so, 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 so to take a step back, basically through a, the, 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 um, the, the, the uh, MTAs and ABAGs uh, modeling, MTCs and ABAGs modeling, they, they started allocating growth uh, both in terms of jobs and in, in housing uh, uh, based upon uh, the areas that cities had basically volunteered up for development. And the model, what it did is basically is, is try to reduce the amount of travel uh, to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas produced by, by cars and trucks. That, that is basically the, is the, um, is the is enormous computer, and that's, they speed out these numbers and they allocate growth accordingly. And so San Francisco is, 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 is slated for an incredible amount of job growth. Um, and as the mayor said yesterday in his response to uh, Supervisor Avalos's uh, comments, this is the city's agenda to grow jobs. Uh, and he commented about how um, there are 35 cranes on our skyline, uh, and, and these are bringing jobs to um, uh, the city. Um, the, um, along with that, um, there is uh, uh, the, the, the computer allocated housing growth. And so San Francisco, well, not the, uh, the, the, the larger share of, of housing growth, is taking. Um, a, a very significant um, increase. Um, it is the largest of, um, uh, in, in, in terms of, of um, uh, you know, total uh, growth, you can see that uh, it, it ranks with San Jose, with, and I, I forget, I did the numbers a little earlier, but we have a, really a fraction of the land mass that San Jose has. Um, and yet we're taking um, uh, uh, close to um, the growth that um, San Jose is causing. This is a, 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 a map um, of uh, uh, a sort of zeroed in on, on the development areas within San Francisco. Um, and the areas that are colored, this is the priority of uh, development areas. And the areas that are in purple are the areas where the city is anticipating, the planning department is anticipating the most amount of increased density. Uh, the, the large uh, dots are where they're proposing affordable housing. Um, but, as I mentioned earlier, um, the communities of concern. Um, this is uh, uh, a, uh, there, there's a, sort of a, a number of factors that, that lead to the definition of a community concern, but that's to, but, but, and, and these are the communities that are going to be most vulnerable to displacement. And as Tim mentioned, they all, almost uh, are contiguous with the uh, areas of, 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 of growth and, and, and development. Um, incidentally, there's a, there's a, there's a great um, Sort of interactive um, mapping uh, tool on MTC's website to, to look at each of these census tracts uh, in terms of the population. Um, the uh, plan itself also uh, uh, conceded uh, and, 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 and acknowledged that, that uh, the net result of the uh, of Plan Bay area uh, will result in uh, displacement, increased displacement. And, and what you see here in this, um, in particular in the community uh, of concern, so the, the, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but no, the, 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 you can see that actually the proposed project proposes the, the greatest amount of impact on communities of concern, that's 36%. Um, and then the alternative five is at 21%. But so uh, I think it's, it's telling that overall, in this region, basically the, the PDA strategy is going to grow growth in areas that are going to most, uh, that, that, that put uh, you know, minorities and low-income communities at greatest risk. And yet, this is the preferred plan. Um, but they have an answer. Um, 
And uh, this is actually the response to uh, comments uh, of concern uh, submitted by many organizations about this increased risk. And so AVEG's response is that this, we, we will build housing and we'll create economic opportunities. Um, that is just. Um, so don't worry. And the model actually, well, the, 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 the analysis of the EIR um, said, well, there's, there may be local displacement, but don't worry. Because we're going to build housing across the region, it will equalize. So, um, and, 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 um, so it, it was a peculiar logic. Uh, I, but, I mean, but anyway, that, the ER said, don't worry. There is not a significant, uh, there's not going to be a significant regional displacement because we plan 100% for the housing, for the housing need. So it's important at this point, I'm going to throw out a little bit more data for people to, you know, sort of risk for the discussion. Um, so because I think to some extent one has to look behind the data, the, the, the model, to, 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 to analyze the results. Um, so uh, I, I pulled together some data on, uh, based upon actual housing production in the city and kind of the area's projected growth. Um, they are proposing more than 3,000 units of construct, new, new construction, net new, each year for the, for the next 30 years. Um, we have only done that, we've only exceeded 3,000 twice, but the average is close to 1,600. Um, so, and, but I think the data speaks for itself. Um, next question, can we make this affordable? Um, uh, Choo Choo, uh, uh, they have, they, they, the, the plan there doesn't actually identify what the breakout is of how much affordable housing is produced, but Choo Choo did some analysis that based upon existing um, uh, trends, uh, well, basic, uh, the basic, the allocation, um, we're looking at producing 34,000 units. Um, basically, the city's rule of thumb is that it takes about $200,000 of subsidy to build uh, uh, an affordable unit. That would mean that we need $6.8 billion. Uh, we just fought very hard. Uh, most of you in the room were on, uh, with us on this, and we, 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 we passed Pop C, which is going to generate $1.3 billion. Uh, through um, 2030. Um, this is actually, I mean, no other city has done this in the region. Um, and, um, uh, and yet we're, we're, we're going to fall. Um, one last slide. This, because, you know, FTC ABAC reassured us that there's two solutions to displacement. One is we'll build. And the other is economic opportunity. This is a projection uh, provided by the Mayor's Office of Housing of, of where, uh, and I'm sorry, you can't read the bottom line, but this is, the, this is jobs that were uh, uh, projected for uh, the, the, the income of, of, of the jobs that are being created in San Francisco. Uh, and that tallest column is less than 50% of AMI. <coughs> And the one in the far side, barely read it on my screen, is 150. So you can, you can see. Well, say what AMI is. Oh, uh, adjusted. Great, thank you very much, Ken. So I think everybody can see the issue here, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I just looked up at Sue Hester and I said, oh my god, there's one more slide. Um, <laughs> um, there is another issue, um, and that involves CEQA. And, 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 and the, there were, uh, there are a number of changes within uh, SB 375, but one of them was to propose a stream, a CEQA streamlining process. Um, and uh, we were sure that this is this is California Environmental Quality Act. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Um, 
And, uh, and basically what it allows uh, cities to do is cut through and eliminate some of this, this, this nuisance of, of, of CEQA and environmental review. Um, and uh, we'll, I think there will be some further discussion about it. But again, uh, the, the various colors here show um, where there's, there's different forms of CEQA streamlining that SB 375 creates. And basically, all of San Francisco is covered by that map. Uh, and that is based upon access to transit, uh, primarily. But in any case, um, and, and so there was a very interesting exchange when the planning department presented before, uh, before the commission a few weeks ago. Uh, and the question was posed, so what does this mean for San Francisco? Look, it looks like most of San Francisco is subject to secret streamlining. And the director said, well, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, but don't worry, we are asking some questions. And actually, the mayor mentioned that yesterday. The mayor also mentioned that they posed some questions to NCTC to figure out what this actually means for San Francisco. Um, so uh, there you have it. Uh, uh, the plan, by the way, is, a, uh, is scheduled to be a, a, approved by NTC and ABAG next month. Thank you again. I'm glad we didn't leave that out. Uh, people who have followed CEQA realize what that means. It means that a lot of the opposition to projects that we have used on environmental grounds is out the window. So anyway, you all see what Gannis is talking about. You see the problem here. They are asking for something that San Francisco can't provide without wholesale displacement of existing communities. That's really what the bottom line is. Um, I just want to say before we go over to the panel, I have been asked to say two things. One is there's a lot of folks in the back if you want to kind of work your way in so that you can hear. Um, we got quite a crowd tonight. Um, we will be sending out the program from tonight as a PDF to people who didn't get programs. Make sure you leave your email address at the door if you want that. And the other thing is, this is being filmed. And if you want to know where you can see the film version of this and see yourselves all on video, um, make sure your email address is at the sign-up sheet in the back. There's a little space around the sides here if you want to make. Um, what? <laughs> Are we big data? No, actually, we're very small data. <laughs> We're an email list. We're not big data. Um, and, and we're happy to share the email list with anybody there's no secrets here. Uh, at this point, why don't we, uh, Cindy Wu is on the Planning Commission, also as a community planner in Chinatown, has been in the middle of a lot of these discussions and what's going on for quite some time now. So why don't we have her take it from here, um, and then we'll go to the other panelists. Cindy. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. 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 So I think I'll bring two perspectives. Um, thank you, Cindy. Thank you again for the presentation to this. So first I'll cover, I think, how we think this um, impacts Chinatown, and then maybe bring some thoughts about what this means for the planning department. So from the Chinatown point of view, we see this kind of large regional planning impacting the neighborhood in multiple ways. So let me say first that we really believe that Chinatown is a complete neighborhood already. It is dense. It has retail. It has residential. It has long-term institutions. It's really sort of what the Plan Bay Area is seeking to achieve, you know, these really complete neighborhoods. But we feel like the plan actually puts all this pressure on the neighborhood that disregards everything that exists, that these complete existing neighborhoods are really um, kind of barely an afterthought in this work. So one way that that is manifest is in housing. So again, showed that um, one of the major goals is to plan for and zone for uh, the significant production of housing. But in neighborhoods that are already built out, I think this is Chinatown, the Mission, TL, this equates to infill housing. And so what we see on the ground is Ellis Act evictions. What we see is pressure to kick out people that are existing, demolish those buildings, and then rebuild larger buildings there. Um, another way that we've seen this happen is through transit planning. So I think that one of the major messages I got from this is that the threat of displacement, I think, looks a little bit different than it had looked in the past, and that one of the major ways that this is happening is large transit projects. So the Van Ness BRT, um, I think many people in the gym are familiar with it, uh, BRT is Bus Rapid Transit, 
So it eliminates all of the left-hand turns. If you're traveling southbound on Van Ness, it, the proposal is that it eliminates all the left-hand turns except for Broadway. And Broadway is the tunnel, or, uh, literally, is the tunnel to Chinatown. And so if you think about all of the traffic, all of the autos coming from North Bay, coming from Marina, traveling to jobs in downtown and in Selma, all of that is going to be funneled through Chinatown. So at the same time, we've been working on uh, a new streetscape plan for Broadway um, for three blocks in Chinatown to improve pedestrian safety, to make sure that those small businesses are viable, to make sure that it doesn't feel like a freeway. But then, you know, then this proposal comes out at the same time. So I think that planning at this large regional level, it really just sort of discounts the hard work that neighborhoods have been doing for decades to try to get their neighborhoods more livable. Um, the, back to this idea of transit projects as sort of um, the genesis for, for some of the threats, I think that there's been this sort of subtle shift in, in transit. Transit is now, I think because um, cities are so popular, everyone wants to move back to cities now. That transit has become somewhat of an amenity rather than a necessity. You know, what we see really is that people, poor folks in our neighborhoods, they just they need transit to get to their jobs, they need transit to go to the doctor, they they, they ride it because they can't afford a car or so on and on. But transit as an amenity, I think, for folks that um, want to live like a new urbanist lifestyle, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think it's, it's shifting the conversation of what the need transit fills. So that brings me to ask then, is this plan sustainable and for who? You know, is it sustainable for commuters that want to commute from the North Bay to their jobs in the growing, growing Soma sector? Or is, is it sustainable for people that are already in <coughs> neighborhoods along these lines? Um, okay, so then shifting to an idea um, about how this impacts the planning department. I think that, so the planning department is finishing a long stream of um, neighborhood plans. Central Corridor is the last one. I think that the ideas in the Plan Bay Area really, um, really push us to look to Central Corridor as, as the last uh, battleground, I suppose, for coming up with tools that address displacement. You know, there are neighborhoods in Soma already that exist, and so through Central Corridor, can we do more than just up zone for more office, up zone for more housing, but can we really think about tools for displacement or tools for relocation or you know whatever it happens to be that, that will help protect the people that already live there? Um, I think that, that adds a, a race and a class element to thinking about increased growth, that it's not just it's not just growth for growth's sake, but who gets to live there, who gets these jobs. I think that after Central Corridor, much of the project of the I mean, much of the work of the planning department is going to be big projects. Um, CPMC might be an example of that. I think going forward, it's going to be projects like Pier 70, um, maybe projects. Um, it's not clear what's going to happen there yet, but the UCSF site and in, in Laurel Heights. And so it's going to be about these large project areas. And so, can we? You know, what are the tools that we have to fight displacement or get the right kind of community benefits out of those projects? And I think we may want to look at CPMC as a model of how to how to build coalitions, how to make sure that all the asks on the, are on the table and, and stick together on those asks um, of affordable housing, of jobs, of infrastructure, of um, open space, of all of that, to make sure that the growth doesn't just add to displacement pressure, but also creates and adds to the neighborhood that exists. Thanks, Amy. Uh, do you want to pick up from there and talk about displacement as it exists in uh, existing communities? Can everybody hear me? Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Maria. I'm the San Francisco Housing Rights Organizer for Causa Justa Just Cause, um, and we are a housing rights uh, and immigrant justice organization here in the Bay Area. Um, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna tell you all about um, a member that I helped out, one of our clients, and a member that I helped out a couple months ago. So her name is also Maria. Her, um, she lives at 23rd and Folsom, and about two months ago, she took her one-year-old to get a shot. Um, and she was coming back home, because she was tired. Um, her baby had just gotten his shots and she was really looking forward to 
um, just resting. When she got home, she found that her landlord had locked her out of her unit, um, and she couldn't get in. She was already a client with us, so she knew that you know she could come to the office and we would help her with her lockout. Um, so this is the same landlord that had illegally evicted her husband not too far, uh, a couple months back. Um, and so there had been various amounts of kind of abuses of, of, of her and, um, and her tenancy. So after a while, we were able to get her back in her unit. Um, and when, when we were able to get back in her unit, the conditions of where she lived were actually really um, like really took me off guard. So she lives in a legally constructed room on the back of the apartment building. The room is so tiny that her full-size mattress touches three out of the four walls in the unit and takes up at least half of the whole room. Um, there, there is mold, there are leaks, um, there is lead in the property that has made its way into her baby's bloodstream. There is no insulation or heat. Um, and she pays $550 for this unit, which is more than half of her monthly income, right? And so I, I talk about this um, because while we, while, um, because this is what planning processes that facilitate and aggravate displacement are gonna do, right? They're gonna push our folks out of the city, of course, and maybe even out of the region, um, but they're also gonna push our communities further and further into inhabitable housing, right? So that's the other, the other question about displacement. We're not always displaced out of our out of our cities. Sometimes we're just displaced out of habitable, safe housing into housing that isn't habitable or safe and makes us sick and makes our loved ones sick. Um, so Maria was able to, and she's still fighting for that house, right? Like even if it's not the best place for her to live, she still is fighting for it and is and wants to keep it. And we're going to help her do it. And 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 the thing is that because she has community and because she knows where in her neighborhood she can get legal resources, she is able to fight for her housing. Um, now imagine if she didn't know where those things were, if she didn't live in a community where she had friends and family around or where there was easily accessible legal support services like ours. And that's kind of where, that's what our, our Causa Justa's um, methods or, method, or methodology for organizing is really an important intervention in being able to fight gentrification and displacement, right? So, we, we work on, on, a, on a couple different levels. Um, we provide support, provide support for tenants um, and homeowners and fighting for their housing. Um, we also work on policy campaigns um, and engage in the electoral process with door-to-door -door civic engagement um, outreach. We also do really intentional leadership development and member development that centralizes the needs and opinions of the most impacted residents in whatever fight we, we're taking a part of. And we think that this approach has the, and we think this is an approach that can be taken to planning as well, right? And planning for communities, and planning for neighborhoods, and planning for regions and cities, because this this approach has the ability to impact not only outcomes but also the process, which is, is equally important. Um, advocacy we know can only only has the potential to impact the outcome, but it is much rarer that it can also impact process and change process. Um, so that's the intervention that base building, organized, grassroots organizing, like, like the kind we do at my organization, is able to provide. It can dynamically change impact, and it can also dynamically change process. Um, so I wanna, I wanna give an example of a way in which um, we were able to dynamically also change process. So um, how many of you all have heard of the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition? Yeah, so the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition was a 10-year um, movement in the mission to fight displacement um, that, um, and, and went above and beyond just, just planning, right? So there were a lot of, of ways in which mission residents fought for their homes and fought for their neighborhoods. Um, so that means that they directed direct action to protect their homes, to protect land, to protect... Um, centers of community and cultural importance in the neighborhood.